Amen. Be seated. It's great to be in New York. It's good to see all of you. Can you guys hear me way back in the back? Amen. Okay. Wow, it is tremendous to be together. Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Definitely want to say thank you to Sam and all the elders here for the invitation to come to the party today and, and to, to share a few thoughts. And uh, it is great to be here. Great to be back in New York. Great to be with the original team. Wow, if you'd have told me 30 years ago, this, whoa, this is mind-blowing and, uh, and incredible. And I want to say a special thank you uh, uh, for Steve and Lisa Johnson. They're not with us today, but thank you so much, Steve and Lisa, for your faith in leading us down here to New York from Boston and coming from different parts of the country, and uh, uh, I just appreciate them so much. Steve and Lisa, of course, discipled Ambrigitte and I and uh, showed us the ropes in the ministry, and I will forever be grateful for that. I'm so thankful to the rest of the 18 who, who came on with the team. I was the last to arrive. There were nine, actually, in the elevator at that midweek Nine, I, I was, we were the last of the second nine uh, to, uh, to arrive in New York. And, and I just uh, want to say thank you to all the, just the entire church. I want to thank you for your tireless support over the last 30 years for mission work around the world, and especially what you've done in Africa. Thank you so much. And I'd like to ask the, the current African leaders that happen to be in attendance today, disciples from Africa, from our African churches, could you please stand up? Those who have traveled for the conference this week from Africa, I want you to stand up. And wave. They're over here. We're over here. Nigeria, Kenya, amen. And wow, it's a long way back. And then can I get those that served on the mission teams that are here today to stand up. Maybe you moved back to the States, but if you served over in Africa, we want you to stand. The Aguayas, Jim Brown, Finnerties, that's right. The Alawayes, amen. It is because of your sacrifice that right now, today, actually, it's already, uh, it's, it's dark now in Africa. It's, it's Sunday night there now. And, and because of your sacrifice and your love and the way you stuck in there with us, there's over 12,000 disciples that worshiped God today across that continent in 74 different churches. And so much of that we all know to God be the glory. And those people, they can't really, most of them cannot afford to fly over here and tell you. So I'm here in their place. Thank you very much, New York, for your sacrifice. It's so awesome what's happening over there, but we better get into the Word of God before they bring a 747 in here to park it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Holy God, as we, as we look at your word today, I pray, Father, that we will be moved and inspired, that we'll rise up to your vision for us to be the light of the world. And I pray, God, fill me with your spirit. Help every word that I say today to be exactly what you want spoken. And I pray, Father, bless us that we'll all leave here with deep conviction. In Jesus' name, amen. We love light, don't we? We love it. <laughs> Man, this is, the, this is such a great city with lights and Broadway and whatever. But the lights that God has created, who could ever get tired of a sunset? How many sunsets have you seen? But we never get tired. We, we, we love the sunsets, the northern lights, the stars, the moon. When you're stumbling around in the dark at night, and you, before you can find your, your cell phone to, to light the path, whatever, and, you know, you're just so glad for that light. When that light turns on, it instantly guides you. It instantly orients you. Light moves fast, going around our planet eight times in one second. 
Light never stops. The unaided eye can see stars that are 6,000 trillion miles away. When you go outside, now you can't see that in Manhattan, but when you get out in the countryside, you can see that the incredible miracle of God's creation all around us. During World War II, the British set up lights out in the countryside to imitate and to mimic a city. And then they shut all the lights down in the cities, tricking the Germans to bomb these fake cities out in the countryside. Because light draws us. We're drawn to light. We go to light. We appreciate light. And we like it in our lives. And this is what we're commanded to be, amen? We're commanded to be light, standing out, moving quickly, never stopping, drawing people to Jesus, orienting and guiding. That's what we need. We need light. When we first arrived in Nairobi, Kenya, I was up late on a Saturday night. Ambrosite uh, was in the bedroom sleeping with Matthew, who was newborn. And I'm there, and I'm working on the sermon for the next morning for this very young church in Nairobi, Kenya. And Ambrosite comes into the, she comes into the, uh, the, the living room, and she goes, Mike, there's a gazelle in the bedroom. And I said, no, no, honey, there's not, we're on the second floor here. There, there's no gazelle. She said, Mike, there's a gazelle in the bedroom, and Matthew is in there with him. I said, okay, let's go in. We went inside. I turned on the light, and it was instantly visible that it was actually a towel that was kind of draped on the, you know, on the dresser, and that Matthew was, was safe from that towel that was going to get up and run at him, whatever. Now, I got to tell that, but then there's the other side of it, too. I don't know if it's the food or the water or whatever, but we would have these funny dreams. And one night I, I, I got up and I, I got out of bed and I threw back the covers and I said, look at this, honey, maggots. And she said, there's no maggots there. I said, maggots, look. And she goes, there's no maggots. And I said, what are you, crazy? <laughs> but when you turn on the light, all that goes away and then you can see and you're instantly oriented. Now you get it. You know where to step. You know what to do. You're not bumping into the walls and the lights. You're not knocking the lamp over, but you're able to do what you need to do. Amen? And the light came into my life in 1980. That's when I started reading the Bible. And for the first time in my life, I grew up going to church, but for the first time in my life, I began to read the Bible and try to put it into practice. I was living in Colorado, and the window of my apartment looked out on the front range, the, the, the Flatiron Mountains there, the beginning of the Rocky Mountains. And I skied, and I was going to bars and parties and going to the mountains. And yes, I was studying, and I thought I had it all. I said, it couldn't be better than being in Boulder, Colorado. And I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy. Something was missing. And I started to read the Bible. And I started to try to put it into practice. But you know, it wasn't so easy. It was challenging. I thought the Bible was just a bunch of stories. I began to see that it really spoke to my life. And one night, I went out with a girl, young lady, and honestly, we messed around. I went home. I opened up my Bible. I started reading Galatians 5. Started reading about all these sins that were in my life. Verse 19 through 21, if you want to check it out sometime. <laughs> and I started crying. I said, I am not going to quit here. I'm, I, I'm going to have to, I got to be all in. And I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to stick with it. And I prayed and I memorized that passage of scripture. And the next morning I went back to that young lady's house and I knocked on the door and she came to the door and she was a little surprised to see me. And I said, I just came to say I'm sorry. I should have treated you with respect last night. That was wrong what I did. And that was the beginning. I decided not just to know about God and to not just read his word, but to put it into practice. And that changed my life forever. It was a turning point. I know people say the church is for old women and sissies. Well, I would agree that church is for old women and it's for sissies too. But church is for everybody. Church is for real men and real women. 
And if you've been reading your Bible, then you know what I know, that it takes guts and courage to put it into practice. Because anybody can just read it. Anybody can say, oh, Jesus was out there with his band of disciples. Isn't that cute? It takes courage to be a disciple. It takes courage to say sorry. It takes courage to tell the truth. It takes courage to take a stand for your faith. And I began to feel that. People began to make fun of me. My brother Roy, he's here. He had a friend. He gave me a hard time. Mike, are you reading the Bible? I thought you were normal. <laughs> it took me a few years to figure this out. But after a few years, I realized that if that guy with the drug abuse and the divorce, if that's normal, give me Jesus any day of the week. But I had to be all in. I had to go for it. So in 1981, I made the decision, and I was baptized. And now I could see. I could see, and I, I stopped stumbling, and I started living. Now, don't get me wrong. I still stumble, and I make my mistakes. But praise God, Jesus, the blood of the Lamb, those mistakes are forgiven, and He's working in my life. So now it's my turn to shine the light. Now it's my turn to let other people know about it. Your friends are going to hassle you if you make this decision today. If you're visiting with us today and you're thinking about becoming a Christian, I get it. It's hard. It's tough sometimes. But you can do it. You can change. Hang in there, buddy. You can make the changes that Jesus calls you to make. And you'll be glad you did. So two years later, I was here. You early guys go, wait a minute. We appointed you an evangelist after only a year. You mean just two years ago before that? Uh-huh. I was not born with a Bible in one hand and a microphone in the other. Actually, I was into drunkenness and immorality, and my girlfriend was on the pill, and I had a lot of changes to make. But praise God, he worked in my life, and I became a Christian. A couple of years later, I ended up here. And when you'd had enough of us, you sent me to Brazil. And I thank God for that time, and then on to Africa. But I just want to say that you can change, and you can change quickly. That's what light's all about. The big need today is we need to shine our light now in this big city. Because you've got a story, brother and sister, just like mine. You've got a story too. And we need to shine our light right here in New York City today. First point is that you need to embrace the honor, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 47. The apostles are preaching, and, and he says, For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I've made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. You know, we bring, we're, we bring light. We're supposed to be light. And we bring salvation. What an honor that is. This call to share the Word of God is such an honor. And I hope if you're, if you're a disciple today, I hope you feel honored by God, called to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. It is an honor. Jesus said He is the light of the world nine, in John 9, 5. And then He says that we're to be the light of the world. And so what we need to be is, is we're going to be light like Jesus. What an honor to be like Jesus and to be called to share that word. To evangelize is an honor. Why do some of us act like it's a chore? It's an honor. How would I feel... If Steve Kennard, and thank you for those words, they were very kind words, Steve is a dear friend, an old friend, but what if Steve Kennard had come out and said, well today I got stuck with the chore of introducing Mike. You know, he's been, a, he's been okay in my life, but I had to share with him because somebody told me I needed to tell you about Mike. So Mike's gonna say a few words now, let's get Sherwin up here. How would I feel? But how do you introduce Jesus? 
Do you get up honored to introduce the Lord of your life? Do you share with people, I want to tell you about somebody, or is it your Bible talk leader going, come on, could you please get off the couch and come with us and share your faith? Oh, do I have to? Oh, Alabama's playing Texas A&M right now. It's an honor to share, is it not? We need to embrace that honor. Angels announced his birth. We get to announce his resurrection. Even, even the word evangelize has in the middle of it the word angel, which is also true in the Greek. You angelizomai, at the heart of that is angel, Greek, angel. When you are asked to share your faith, you're being plucked, we are being plucked out of a normal earthly existence and brought into the angelic realm of announcing the empty tomb. It's an honor, brothers and sisters. So we need to stop acting like somebody's asking us to clean up our room or make our bed. We need to stop feeling like, moaning like, oh, do I have to go knock on a few doors today? We need to stop acting like we're doing him a favor and start feeling the honor that he has bestowed upon us that we even get to announce about the Lord Jesus to this city. Amen? I'm telling you, it's an honor. Moses saw the light, and he literally glowed. Paul saw the light, and he was blind. John saw the light, Revelation 1.17, and he fell before him as though one dead. How dare we see the light and shrug it off? We need to have a fire. We need to glow with the message of Jesus for this great city. Amen? Now, I know some of us in here, you're doing exactly that. But some of us in here, I'm guessing maybe there are a few who aren't. And I'm, I'm here today to encourage those who aren't and those who are. But we all need to get on the ball. Amen? Am I right? I think about all that he's done for us. We forget what he's done for us. You know, in the world, in our nation, after 10 years, 50% of our marriages in America end in divorce. Now, I asked Sam, we've had a handful of divorces in the New York City Church over the last few years, and we've had a few in San Antonio. But we have not had statistically 500 divorces in the New York City Church. Why is that? Because the light of the Lord Jesus Christ showed us the way. We're not the message. Jesus is the message. Statistically, according to NPR, 30% of our youth are arrested by the time they're 23 years old. Now, we've had a handful of our youth get arrested in this congregation, and we'd like to honor you today by bringing you up onto the stage here for a moment. No. Just kidding. I almost got arrested myself in high school when I tried to steal a car. That's just where I was at. Please don't do that. Uh, but I feel you, okay? I can feel you there. We've had a few knuckleheads in this congregation get arrested, I'm sure. But we have not had a hundred and fifty. Why is that? Because Jesus has turned on the light in our lives. When you came to church today, maybe you thought, I don't know, am I going to a white church? Am I going to a black church? <laughs> well, wait, it's a black guy that introduced the speaker. Oh, no, it was a white guy who's preaching. It was a Latino guy doing this. Wait a minute, where am I? You just, you didn't come to white church, black church, or Latino church. You just came to church. <laughs> well, these people all seem to love each other. Mm-hmm. We do. Why? Because the light of Jesus Christ has shined into our lives. So I get to have best friends like Nietzsche Aguaya or Richard Alawaye or Sam Powell or Steve Kennard or whatever. The whole spectrum, we're all buddies here. That's Jesus. It wouldn't be that way if it hadn't have been for Jesus. You've got a lot to thank God for. You've got a lot to bubble over with. 
every time you interact with other New Yorkers. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? It's an honor to announce this good news to New York. So we got to embrace. We got to embrace that honor. And we got to be, we got to leap into action and take pride in our commission. Yes, pride, good pride. There's a lot in the Bible on good pride, not bad pride, not Galatians 5 pride, Galatians 6 pride. We need to take pride. We're ambassadors. We're his sons. We're his daughters. We're saints. He lives in us. He goes before us. He protects us. We are called co-workers with Christ. For goodness sakes, it's an honor. Let's act like it every day. Let it shine. Second, we need to engage the battle. Turn to Hebrews 10, verse 36. Hebrews 10, verse 36. 35. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly, richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. What do we need to do? He's coming back. He won't delay. We need to live by faith. And we do not, we don't shrink back. Amen? We don't shrink back. Now, in World War II, Hitler, he had promised even in his book, Mein Kampf, what he would do. He'd spelled it out in his book, what he was going to do. Yet England and France believed, they believed in the empty promises that Hitler made about peace. Then Hitler occupied the Rhineland, annexed Austria, took over Sudetenland. Then he took Czechoslovakia. And in spite of all these moves, England and France still held to the empty promises of peace. And so in, an, in a desperate move to appease Hitler, you see Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain getting off the plane, coming back from Berlin with a piece of paper in his hand, an empty promise from Hitler, and Chamberlain declared, peace in our time. War loomed. They stuck their heads in the sand. And they didn't wake up to reality until the bombs began to fall. In Parliament, Winston Churchill stood up and he said, we're in danger. This is a time we need to prepare for war. And he was shouted down in anger because they would not face the truth of what was about to happen. And Chamberlain was wrong, and Churchill was right. We should never shrink back from the fight that's before us. We must engage this battle that we're in. We can't say peace, peace, when there is no peace. We've got to have the courage to embrace this fight that is in front of us. Amen? We must not shrink back, but we do. We go to restaurants. And we don't say a word. We live in neighborhoods. We don't reach out. We go to work. We don't tell people. We cannot shrink back. People need to hear the truth. Some of us in here, now I'm just going to be honest. Because I get on a plane and go back to Texas tonight. No, I love you. I'm family. I was a member of this church for five years. Some of us haven't brought a visitor in a year. Come on, engage. Engage. You know who you are. Maybe one of the great films of the 1980s. It's a deep, powerful film. It's Tom Cruise, Top Gun. Tom Cruise played Maverick. Val Kilmer played Iceman. Iceman's the real hero of the movie, isn't he? He's the guy who knew how to do it. Tom Cruise is the one who can't get his act together. And I tell you what, I know it's silly. I know it's silly, but I get a lump in my throat when I think about the end of that movie. And hopefully you've seen it, because I'm about to ruin it. 
But there at the end of that movie, man, Val Kilmer, Iceman, he's in a battle. There's bogeys all around him. He's saying into the radio, there's bogeys all around me. Maverick's been afraid. He, he pulls out of the battle. He goes, Maverick, engage. Maverick, come on, man. I'm surrounded by bogeys. Engage, Maverick. And Tom Cruise engages, and they shoot all the Russians down, and now they're our friends. I don't know who it would be if the movie was made today, but anyway, he comes on back, and it ends, whatever. But can you hear the voice of Jesus on the radio? New York, engage. There's bogeys all around. Get in the fight. Shine that light. That speaks to me. I remember in the dorm room when I first started studying the Bible, and I remember standing outside somebody's dorm room and being afraid to go in. And I stood, and I'm, I'm a big guy. I'm not a shy person. But I'm standing there in the hallway and I'm scratching my head because this one had me afraid. I'm going to actually go in here and talk to this guy about coming to a Bible discussion that I was attending. I was afraid. Have you ever felt afraid? Absolutely. But I can hear that voice, engage, Mike, engage. I know when I became the campus ministry intern at Duke University, and I remember going over there the first day, I walked over there all alone, and I'm standing there on the campus. I walked in, I just turned around, I went into the men's room, and I, I just stood there, trying, may I read the newspaper here, wash my hands 15 times like I'm going into surgery or something, and, and I walked back out, and I got scared again. I walked back home. I spent like six hours on campus, met one person, got a stomach ache, went home to my wife. This is scary to me. Why? Why am, I, why am I being this way? I said, forget it. I'm not going to try to be cool. I'm not going to try to be whatever. I'm just going to go over there. I'm just going to start knocking on doors in the dormitory and inviting people out. And that's what I did. In a few days, I was studying the Bible with 10 people. But I had to get past my fear. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, Mike, you're so good at sharing. No, you know who's really good at sharing their faith? It's my wife. No matter where we are. My, me and my boys will look at her. She starts up a conversation with anybody. I, I turn around. I'm reading directions about waiting for this line at a museum. I turn around. Amber Sheet is now best friends with the lady selling the hats. I'm like, how did that happen? I go, wow, I, I need to share my faith, whatever. I turn around. Hey, how's it going? The guy goes, <laughs> She's awesome in the world of evangelism. She's like, Tiger Woods. I'm like a weekend hacker. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, bro, sister. Just get out there. Just lay your gift before the altar. Do your best. That's what counts, right? That's what counts. Engage. Nietzsche, I don't know of a man more fearless than Nietzsche. <laughs> Nietzsche is a gutsy guy. And we've seen some funny things. Actually, Nietzsche did get arrested in Africa because here come the army tanks in one country. Nietzsche pulls out his camera and takes pictures. The soldiers ran up to his apartment and grabbed him and arrested him, did they not? Amen. <laughs> so you're one of the 30%. <laughs> but Nietzsche was out sharing his faith. He was on the subway. And he was so scared, he said to the person, they invited him to church, he said, now what's your name? The guy said his name. The person said, what's your name? And he goes, uh, 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 he forgot his own name. <laughs> How many of us have been afraid sharing our faith? Come on, man. We've got to engage. We've got to get past this fear and recognize, hey, I'm going to embrace the honor. And I mean, come on, really, fear? It's just common courtesy. Let's share with people. Let's engage this battle, amen? amen? Pierce Anthony said, being terrified, but going ahead and doing what must be done, that's courage. The one who feels no fear is a fool. And the one who lets fear rule him is a coward. I'm asking you today. I remember back in the old days when we talked in discipleship group in the early days here, man, we should, we should invite whole train loads of people on the subway. We talked about it. We didn't do it. We talked about it, but we all chickened out. It was Steve Kennard. He gave me a call later on that day. He said, Mike, I was preaching on the train. It's probably the first time that anyone in New York heard somebody accurately preach from Hosea chapter 2 and share the Hebrew with them, and it was all correct and biblical and right.
We had, ba we had mission teams where 20 baptized 1,000. Sorry, where 20 baptized 100. And it's not fair to compare a mission team handpicked to a church that's established because we got to spend thousands of hours with our kids. They're our most important audience. On the other hand, church, does it really take a thousand people to baptize a hundred? Does it really? Let's get rid of our fear. Let's crucify our laziness. Let's chop down some of the thorns that have grown up in our garden. Many of us are here today, disciples, I'm asking you, are you in the grandstands? Do you need to come down and get back on the field? Come down out of the grandstands. Let's get on the field and let's engage. Can you hear the Lord's voice in the headset? Maverick, engage. Amen? We need grit. Brian Hale has grit. He has grit. We're talking about engaged the battle, engaging in the battle. Brian Hale is a dentist in San Antonio. He said, I am so convicted. He said, I'm not going to leave a restaurant. I'm not going to go through a day without sharing my faith. Within a few weeks, he had four men that were studying the Bible with him, and he had 10 other men that he was looking, hey, can somebody help me to get in and study the Bible with these 10 other guys? Why? Because he engaged. He engaged. We need that kind of grit today. That's what New York needs. Amen? And of course, Winston Churchill had grit. He had grit. One time, Lady Astor said to him, Churchill, if you were my husband, I would put poison in your tea. And Churchill shot back, Lady Astor, if you were my wife, I would drink it. <laughs> One time outside of Parliament, Lady Astor shouted, Churchill, you're drunk. Churchill, he shot back, Lady Astor, you're ugly. But I'll be sober in the morning. We need grit. We need that kind of grit. We need to engage. Duty calls. Get on your horse. Get up in the battle. Maverick, engage. Last point, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 4 and 5 introduce us to, to God and Jesus. And then in Revelation chapter 6, we, the word of God is to be proclaimed around the world. And all these things are going to happen. The preaching, persecution, famine, all this. It's, it's a powerful passage. But we begin here in verse 1. I'm just going to read the first two verses of Revelation chapter 6. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come. I looked, and there before me was a white horse... Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. We need, finally, to embark with confidence. Embark with confidence. We ride out like conquerors, because Jesus in this passage, he's the lamb. He's the lamb that opens the seal. We as a church ride out on the horse with the gospel. And we proclaim that word like conquerors bent on conquest. We ride out with confidence. And he says here that he was given a crown. We ride out with a crown. Isn't it interesting that we ride out with the crown? I think that's interesting. You don't, last year, everyone in my hometown there, San Antonio, Texas, we were so sad when the Miami Heat won game six and then won game seven. Oh, and now you're applauding. I can't believe it. <laughs> and I, we were just so, a few of you. And you know what? There's grace, even for Miami Heat fans. Amen. <laughs> but even the Miami Heat, and they're an awesome team, and they deserve to win. But as awesome as they were, they did not wear their hats until they won. They didn't put on their T-shirts before Game 7. They waited until after game seven. We are even more confident than the Miami Heat because we ride out with the crown of victory, the Stephanos, on our head. 
We ride into battle wearing the crown. You ever thought about that? That's how confident we are. We overcome the devil with the, blood and the, with the blood of the Lamb. We have incredible confidence because of Jesus Christ. So we should be bold, confident. We should be like Navy SEALs. We should be tough and confident in Jesus. This isn't the time for safe or wimpy goals. This is a time for us to be supremely confident in our Lord Jesus, who's with us. New York Church, we once all fit in an elevator. We need to keep dreaming. We need to keep dreaming big and large for what God wants to do in this area, amen? Now, one reason that we can dream big and be so confident is because we pray. Prayer is awesome. Prayer allows us to get God involved in our lives. I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. John 6, 23. Whoa, whatever? He'll give you whatever you ask in my name. Now it has to be 1 John 5, 14, in accordance with God's will. So no, you cannot pray right now, dear Lord, please turn my 1999 Corolla into a 2013 Mercedes during the church service, amen. I don't think that's in accord with God's will but maybe you'll prove me wrong. <laughs> Think about it, whatever. He says, ask and you'll receive and your joy will be complete. Answered prayers make us happy. People told us, people said, you're not gonna raise the money to plant all those mission teams, but we raised the money and those mission teams went. How are you gonna get people to go to all those cities? But brave people stood up and said, I wanna go. You can't get visas to all the visas never held us out of any single country we targeted. What about the culture? We loved it, learning it. What about languages? I learned three languages on the mission field, Portuguese, Swahili, and French. I think some, one reason people came to church was just to hear the American try to preach their language. I remember Jim Brown in Brazil, and he was doing a campus devotional one night and he was talking about mountain climbing. And he said, we're gonna go out climbing without, and he said, what's the word for rope? And he guessed, ropa. We're gonna go climbing without ropa. But ropa in Portuguese means clothing. And here was the evangelist talking about mountain climbing naked. People loved it, they got baptized. But it wasn't just Jim, it was me. One time I was talking to the single guys and I was trying to say that if you go on a date, it doesn't have to be expensive. You could, it, you know, that cheap, it cheap's okay. And I said, barata, basta. Barata, I thought that was the word for cheap. No, barato is the word for cheap. I said that a cockroach is good enough for your date. But in spite of us, prayers were answered. People became Christians. It's amazing. So be bold. Pray for boldness. Pray for open people like us in foreign lands. We didn't know how to say it. Sometimes we made all kinds of mistakes. Sometimes people laughed at us. But they got the message. They opened up the word. You do the same. Pray for open people. Pray for the skill to say it as best you can. And pray to be involved in some Bible studies. This confidence we have, we have because of Jesus Christ. And I know in a room like this, that some of us are hurting. Mike, it's hard to shine. Right now I'm hurting. I'm beaten up spiritually. Well, last year my mom, my mother died. Last year my brother had a rare blood disease, he almost died. My other brother had a stroke. One of my sons had a, an intense heart illness. And all of them faced this with faith. And because Roy's here today, I'm gonna to embarrass Roy, he's one of your elders. I'm gonna say, Roy, your faith during all those struggles was incredible to me. And it's true. Our mom, she was a disciple. 
and I think you'd agree that her faith, two years with liver cancer, died of it. Her faith was an inspiration to us. I learned watching her, and I learned watching you, Roy. We prayed for mom's cure and didn't get it. Paul said three times I pleaded with the Lord, three times, and the answer was no. Jesus prayed, God, let this cup pass from me, and the answer was no. And if Paul can be told no and Jesus can be told no, then I can be told no, because his grace is sufficient for me and his power will be made perfect in all my weakness. That's how it works. My wife has hepatitis C. It's an illness that kills more people than HIV. My wife's an inspiration to me every day. She gets up, she serves the Lord, and she serves her family. And there's no cure for the disease. But honey, I love you. And in the midst of those trials, she shines. Roy, you, you shined very brightly in the middle of that. Being a Christian, it does not mean that every difficulty is avoided. It does not mean that every job you apply for accepts you. It does not mean that your parents won't die, your tires won't go flat, weeds won't grow in your yard, and you can eat all the Doritos you want and never gain weight. It doesn't mean that. <laughs> in this last year in my family, even we dealt with some issues with mental illness. And I, there's a stigma about mental illness at times. Why is it that when someone hurts their arm, we go toward them, but when someone says I'm bipolar, we back away? Why is that? You know, there's something about that that... But I want to say that in this room, there's no stigma here. And some of you today, you've prayed for a cure, and there's no cure yet. But your light shining doesn't mean necessarily a cure. What it means is that you're faithful in the midst of it. And there are people right here today, you're dealing with depression or you're dealing with a bipolar or you're obsessive, compulsive, whatever, and I just want you to know that your light shines brightly as you remain faithful and trust the Lord in the midst of those struggles. Some of my greatest heroes are people who are living with these issues and they're dealing with it every day. And I praise God because God's grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in weakness. And I just, that's just, that's it. That's how we shine. So I'm going to close up with this because I know they're going to come up here and lead a song. I've known Ambrosite since 1966. I was seven, she was four when we met at the church. She fell in love with me instantly as a four-year-old. It took me a little bit longer, but I took her to lunch in 1979, and that decision changed my life in a wonderful, awesome way. You can make a decision today. If you are somebody in this church that's been in the grandstands, you've been on the sidelines, and you need to embrace the honor and engage the battle and embark with confidence, then I'm calling you to a decision. Will we face the challenge or run? Will we find solutions or excuses? Will we build here or will we blame? Will we be victors or victims? I'm asking us, New York, let's make a decision. It's time to decide. Let's light it up for the next 30 years. Amen? God bless.